he was in prison for several months, and he became and they didn't really feed him very well, so he was he became very thin, and somehow he was able to actually wiggle himself through the uh, cell, through the door, through the window of the prison. As he was running across the frozen lake to escape his punishment, a prison guards prison guards noticed him, and they started running after him. Now prison guards were much thicker, and so as they started running after Dirk Willems. Uh, one prison guard particularly uh, crashed, crashed through the ice and fell through the ice down into, into cold ice water and started drowning. So he went back and he saved the guard. He took him out of the frozen lake. He saved the life of the guard. The guard still captured him, took him back to prison, and he was hanged the next week. The Lineage Journey Podcast, unscripted conversations that aim to help you on the journey of discovering your lineage. Join us as we take a deeper look into past lineage episodes and see the lessons we can learn for today. Hi there, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Lineage Journey Podcast. Today we've got a very interesting and exciting guest with us. I have Dr. Deutschen Zivadinovic. He is currently located at Weimar University where he is a professor of church history. He studied previously at Cologne University in France with his bachelor's and master's and gained his uh, PhD in church history at Andrews University. And currently he teaches here at Weimar University. Originally from Croatia, he's a man of varied experience and has a uh, strong background in church history. And we're very welcome. We're very glad, sorry, to have you here with us. So welcome. Thank and you. I understand they call you Dr. Z around here. Is that correct? Yes. My last name, Zivadinovic, is a little bit of a tongue twister. So <laughs> it's spelled with Z with a little thing on top. That sounds Z in my language. So they say Dr. Z just for, for brevity's sake. Brevet. Okay. So is there anything else about your bio or introduction you want to mention? You married, kids? Married with one wife and have two kids, two daughters. The youngest one is only three and a half months. Okay. So that's a joy. Wow. Yeah, three and a half months. You're in the uh, yeah early stages. Early stages of parenting, actually. The, the first one is four years old, so the other one is three and a half. Okay. So, so how long have you been teaching church history? So that's this is this is pretty much my sixth, seventh year okay. of teaching here at uh -huh. Weimar. And um, I've been teaching before as substitute teaching at Angels University for Dr. Damstig or Dr. Reeve a few times as oh, well. Oh, wow. So you studied under Dr. Damstig. Right, yeah. He's like the guru. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good teacher. Very good, very good. Okay. Yes, I learned a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, and other, other professors at Angels also. Okay. Especially church history department. It's a good department. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is. They've got some good teachers up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Today we're going to talk about a particular period of the Reformation history. You're familiar with Linear's journey. Right. And so in this podcast, we're just going in, into maybe a little bit more detail in specific areas. And this is actually an area which we did do an episode on. But as you know, our episodes are only five minutes long. So we're going to un be able to unpack a little bit more history here. We did do an episode on the, um, the Anabaptists. Now, they're, a, I believe, a very interesting and fascinating group. Right. And... I understand you have a particular interest in them, or you like the history. I do. I do. Anabaptists are pretty much visionaries of their time. They're they're mm. way ahead of their time. It's kind of like painful how much ahead of the other reformers mm. they were. Uh, they were so spot on when it comes to certain doctrines that they discovered 300 years before the other reformers. When you're so far away from some other people, it, you become an, you're kind of like annoying. True. Yeah, because so, <laughs> you're way ahead of them, and they, and they think you're just off left field. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So what? What decade? No, not decade. What? What century would you say they came to prominence in? Well, the Anabaptists movement. We as um, as historians, they look at it as 16th century during the Reformation, very early, uh, very early in the early stages of, of of Reformation. They started kind of developing more in Switzerland. 
Okay. They came out of Zwingli's uh, school of thought at first. Okay. But they pushed more and more into seeking for further reforms while other reformers were hesitant to be so radical and progressive in reforming the church further. And the group and many uh, and the Anabaptist group from from Zurich, for, for, that's kind of um, the beginning. Now, some scholars like uh, Leonard Verdun, uh, they assert that the Anabaptist school of thought existed throughout the Middle Ages in the Waldensian movement. Uh -huh. Okay. And so he sees them as a continuation rather than a new group. Okay. In the 1600s. In 1600, maybe the Swiss group was a new group. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as the Swiss group uh, started digging for a new truth, mm -hmm. they soon found adherence to that, especially in the Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. Where the where the mm -hmm. Waldensian movement Had was buried, settled. Yeah. resettled in in Bohemia. That's fascinating, yeah. Because sometimes you think they're just isolated, right? But it's interesting. I think to, I, I really believe there was synergy between these different groups in in there some was, in the, some form or fashion. There's there are clear documentation that the Moravians and the Hussites who were affected by the Bohemian Waldensians. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Waldensians had a, two schools of thought as well within them in the Middle Ages. They had an Italian school in the in the in the mm -hmm. uh, Alps. But they also had a very strong school in the Bohemia, in okay. the country of Bohemia. And there is a connection between those two. And the Bohemians were more conservative. And they're mentioned in documents, uh, medieval papal inquisitor documents, as Sabbath keepers. Okay. While the ones in the Alps, uh, we don't have documentation except maybe one, a few pastors there. So there's kind keepers. of, you believe there's a link between some of those Waldensians to the, uh, right. to the Anabaptists It seems when up. the Reformation and the Anabaptist movement started uh, kind of growing and spreading that those who were previously um, Anabaptists or, or previously Waldensians in the Eastern Europe areas of Slovakia, Bohemia, Silesia, Southern Poland, uh, those accepted more Anabaptist side of the Reformation okay. because it sounded much closer to, to what they knew as true, uh, true, uh, hmm. true teaching of the Bible. Okay, and so there are distinct. Th there's major differences between Anabaptists and the magisterial reformers like Luther. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask that next because often when we think of the Reformation, if you ask the average person who has a moderate understanding of the Reformation, they would say, "Well, Reformation would be Martin Luther, right. John Calvin, John Knox, etc." Um, and like you said, that's termed as the magisterial. Reformation. So maybe could you just give our, our listeners just a quick difference between what would be a definition of the Magisterial Reformation right. and then what would be a definition of... Radical Reformation. Yeah, the Radical Reformation. So Magisterial Reformation, as the name suggests, uh, they really need the magistrates or they need the kings and princes to protect them. Okay. And they would not really... Um, uh, they really wouldn't separate church from the state. So, so they would convert the prince or the or the or the regional ruler, and so once you convert a regional prince or ruler or um, or governor, you're protected, and then you can preach in that area. Hmm. The radicals they said we don't need that. Uh, we don't care being killed. We're just going to preach to everyone, and we don't need protection from the prince. And the, because if you if you're seeking protection from the prince. Uh, you can go as far as re in reforming the church as far as the prince wants to go. Mm -hmm. So if the if the prince is not fully persuaded that you, they need to, for example, uh, reject infant baptism mm -hmm. or accept the biblical Sabbath or reject the original sin and different things that the uh, Anabaptists were teaching, uh, then it, it was it was you couldn't really reform the church further because the the the. Uh, the regional rulers were also rulers of the church. And so that was hampering a uh, Reformation impetus. Mm -hmm. And so Anabaptists, they didn't really seek protection or approval of from the, the king of the state. Mm -hmm. While the Lutherans and Zwingli specifically, he says, we're going to go as far as the Zurich Council mm -hmm. votes. So if the Zurich Council votes that we don't have infant, ba that we don't have adult baptism, we're going to stop there. Hmm. And the and the Anabaptists were saying, well, what if majority is wrong? Do we have to err, err, and be in error, and continue living in 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 papal do doctrines and sins hmm. just because mm -hmm. the majority is not convinced yet? Hmm. So that was the difference. But magisterial reformers, uh, they they were willing to go and reforming as far as the state would go. Okay. So what would you say would be? Is there any 
I, I, th I think you've kind of already said it, but maybe let's just kind of zero in on it. What was the particular identifying mark of the Anabaptist Radical Reformation? What were right. you? Like? So as the name suggests, Anabaptists is just it's a Greek term. Ana means rebaptizer, mm -hmm. rebaptizers. Okay. So they would baptize or rebaptize uh, people who uh, who were already baptized as infants. The Anabaptists were really pushing to the logical conclusions, the idea of Martin Luther and you're justified by faith. Mm -hmm. And they say, kids, uh, children, babies don't have faith. Faith is something that you need to express, y you know, and they would read like faith is dead without works. How can a baby produce works? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, the true faith is, is a, a personal choice, a personal experience that the Anabaptists were saying. And therefore, there is no need to baptize babies. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was that, that the baptizing infants back in those days was the only way you were able to register who gets to be born, what's their Christian name, and who you're going to tax. Mm. So if you don't have a registry, then you don't have income of taxing. It's like your babies are born in some villages over there in Switzerland no or villages of Germany. Nobody knows the babies are being born. You don't bring them to church to be baptized. We don't have the census. It's really mm -hmm. hard to go later and, and pick up the census. Mm -hmm. So the magisterial reformers will, were kind of like, no, 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 <laughs> we we can't go, f we, we cannot reform so much because now we're pushing, we're poking the bear, which is the state and the taxes. Mm -hmm. And so that started being a problem. And uh, the, the infant baptism was really the, f was just the tip of the iceberg, really. Mm -hmm. The infant baptism for Anabaptists was, um, we don't baptize infants because they don't they don't have personal faith and personal decision to be baptized. So they're taking Martin Luther. Martin Luther is just live by faith. So how right. can a how can a baby have faith if mm -hmm. we're justified by faith? And so well, they well the other reformers like Luther and Zwingli they would respond, they would try to defend, and they would try to say, well, you know, you need to be cleansed from the original sin. And they're like, wait a second, baptism. Is not a cleansing, magical cleansing. Mm -hmm. This is cat this is the yeah. Catholicism you're trying to come out of. Mm. Baptism is a symbol of you dying to self, mm -hmm. dying to your sinful nature and rising in the newness. How can a baby do that? Mm. How can a baby make that conscious choice? It's something we it's understand. It's just a form. Yeah. You're just doing formalism. You're doing just ho hocus pocus magic. Tradition. The tradition. So get rid of that tradition. The magisterial reformers didn't want to go there. And so Anabaptists started saying, well, what are you talking about original? First of all, original sin, the oh, baby needs to be cleansed from the original sin. Um, what do you mean original sin? The baby's an innocent when they're born. They need to make a conscious decision to sin in mm -hmm. order to be sinners. They might have a sinful uh, propensities or sinful tendencies, but they're not guilty. Yeah, yeah. And so there's no need for that. And to that, that, take, that took away Anabaptists into a completely different theology. When you don't have original sin theology, then you don't. Then Jesus can come in this world to be baby just like us. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus can be human just like us. It radically impacts you. That know. radically impacts the whole theology. If Jesus yeah. is just like us, then he's our example. Then we have to follow his example, mm -hmm. live like him, because he came with the same body like we came. But the Catholics didn't believe that because they believed in original sin. If there's original sin idea, then how can Jesus take original sin? Jesus then would be sinful. Mm -hmm. Well, no, then Jesus took immaculate body. It's called immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. And the Protestants accepted the same idea. So a lot of the magisterial reformers, they, and we do talk about this, we say, well, they they were progressing and they were learning, but mm -hmm. it's almost like they're progressing and learning and breaking away from Rome, but the Anabaptists were on a fast track and these guys were on a slow track on some areas. Right, definitely. Mm. Definitely, that brought friction. So we've got rebap. Anabaptism means rebaptism. Anything else in terms of an identifying mark of them? So the you Anabaptists, because first in the Switzerland they started saying we don't need infant baptism. We need adult baptism. Well, why? Well, because there is no original sin. Well, mm. if there is no original sin, then then we don't have original sin. Then Jesus came just like that's a, that. Then Jesus was able to come to this world in our body, mm -hmm. just like we are, because we don't get the original sin. We mm -hmm. get maybe uh, original weakness mm -hmm. or uh, weakness that leads us to sin, mm -hmm. but we don't get sin. So Jesus can come as a baby, just like we are. And that, and he overcame sin 
to be just like a human. That means it's possible to overcome sin hmm. as a human. So we see that playing out today still in right. In and different... so for Anabaptists, it became not just justified, but also I need to be sanctified. sanctified. We need to continue growing to become like Christ. Is not just a substitute; He's an example as mm. well. Substitute and example. Right. It's fascinating because we see all those issues kind of still playing out in Christianity Absolutely. and Adventism. Absolutely. And Adventism today. Yep. Um, why do you think it is that we tend to focus more on the magisterial reform- reformers than we do the radical reformers as a church? Or, you know, because we don't really hear too much about the Anabaptists or the radical reformation. Well, is that just those are big heroes and they're protected by the state. Mm. So the state financed them. The state published their books, Luther and Calvin. They just had and, more, more writings. And so they just had a more of a tradition and they became the narrative heroes mm-hmm. that broke away from Rome and and brought, uh, and, and, and not to knock down Luther and Zwingli, mm-hmm. they did, the, I believe, the best they could mm-hmm. with the circumstances that they had. And so they were, they are the heroes for me mm-hmm. as well. And so they're the heroes that they really started this movement of going out of Babylon, out of the Middle Age darkness. And they brought, there's so many different improvements that just even nominal Protestantism Mm -hmm. brought to the Western civilization, bringing literacy and the Bible and the scientific Mm -hmm. revolution and the um, scientific reading of the Bible and and science and all that stuff. So, and so, so sometimes we focus on those big heroes and, um, and and sometimes, um, yeah, some of those Anabaptists, like they call them the stepchildren of the Reformation. Stepchild, yeah. They're forgotten sometimes in yeah. the shadow of those but also, charismatic I think, characters. I think your like, point is, is, is good, is right as well. Those those yeah. who write the history are remembered by it. And, uh, that's right. And they weren't. And, and Anabaptists were really persecuted by both Catholics and, and Protestants. Protestants. And Protestants would destroy and kill thousands of Anabaptists. That's a sad part. That's a sad the, part of present history. Yeah, that they kind of persecuted those who progress further than they they right. thought they should progress. There's another reason why, um, even in, in in even in academic historiography, and even in Adventism, and also in, in Christian uh, history, Anabaptists kind of took a back seat, uh, looking at them. Um, even though many today, many evangelical features of evangelical Christianity in America, they really have strong Anabaptist features, mm-hmm. like free will yeah. and uh, a separation of church and state. Mm-hmm. You know, that, this is all Anabaptist ideas yeah, yeah. that kind of entered into the mainline Protestant churches. But the, the reason why the Anabaptists were in the back seat is because uh, most of the things that the Anabaptists would write was in German. And it was uh, they were kind of really minority to a degree. Some Many of them escaped to Eastern Europe, and just, they didn't have a lot of interaction with the rest of the academic world in the West. Western Europe. And yeah, and um, another reason is because um, the Anabaptism as a movement was confused with the social revolutionists of the Peasants' Revolt of hmm. the uh, 1520s. Okay. So this is another reason. So, so Anab- when you say Anabaptist, for a, many centuries, it wasn't clear what you mean. Uh, because you maybe unpack, yeah, unpack that a little bit Let's unpack more. that a little bit. Yeah. So there was one, only one, quote unquote, Anabaptist leader by the name of Thomas Munza. Mm-hmm. And he was a socialist revolutionist. He was a Martin Luther's disciple. He was in Germany. He was, was he? in Germany, okay. not in Switzerland. He was in Germany. He wasn't connected with the Anabaptists in Switzerland, but he also rejected infant baptism. Okay. So he's got that similarity. So he has one similarity with those pacifist mm-hmm. Anabaptists in Switzerland. And so he is really pushing no infant baptism, no need to pay taxes, no, yeah, because mm-hmm. no infant baptism, no recording yeah. who's uh-huh. born, no, no need, there's no need for mm-hmm. taxes. We don't need to pay so much exorbitant taxes to the government, to the state, to the bishops, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So we need to have more equality. We need to have a social system like in the New Testament by force. So Thomas Munzer, that's why if you go to Eastern Germany, you see the money on, in, during, the, during the socialist communist period in Eastern Germany, on their money, they had Thomas Munzer. Oh, wow. So he was a hero. He of- was a hero of socialism. And so because of, and he caused about 100,000 peasants to be slaughtered in Germany. There was a big civil war mm-hmm. between the German yeah, nobility yeah. and the peasants. And so because of that, Anabaptism got a bad reputation. 
Hmm. And so everybody who would start talking about no infant baptism, mm-hmm. they get they get lumped with like, Munzer. Are you? Mun-? They got lumped with Munzer. And so for many centuries, that hasn't been disassociated properly. Hmm. And it, it hasn't been in, until 1951, a uh, book by jo- uh, George Williams, by the name of George Wilkinson, sorry, George Wilkinson, there's a book by, called Radical Reformation. Okay. In 1951, finally, the, it's a book, 600 pages, that actually this dissects different different groups of the Anabaptists. Mm-hmm. There's some, a majority of Anabaptists were, were pacifists. Mm. They actually believed in no war, no killing, not even in self-defense. And so they would actually, there's a letter of uh, a Conrad Grebel. He's one of the leaders of the original Anabaptist movement mm-hmm. in Switzerland, in Zurich, who broke away from Zwingli. He, he writes this, he writes a letter to Munzer. Now that letter has only been discovered in the mid 20th century. Because it was written in German, Uh it was just one copy Mm -hmm. in one library somewhere, okay? So here's a letter of Conrad Grebel to Thomas Munzer. It says, true Christian believers are sheep among wolves, sheep for the slaughter. Neither do they use worldly sword or war since all killing has ceased with them. Wow. So the true Anabaptist spirit was, uh, we separate from the state. We don't need the magistrate to protect us. Mm-hmm. We don't need the magistrate to tell us what to believe, how far we can reform, or to protect us at all. And we're gonna, we, if we need to die for the truth, so be it. That was Anabaptism, really, mm. the core. And that's really Waldensian thing as well. Is, so yeah. you can see that mm-hmm. connection. So you keep mentioning this separation of church and state. So that was kind of a core belief, um, understanding of scripture from them. That right. I, I guess we inherit as 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 Adventists today as well. Right, because they were pinned by the state Mm -hmm. to conform to how much, so, so when you have this, so this is, this is kind of situational. So it all started with the Zurich uh, and Zwingli reformers and Zwingli had a group of scholars around him and, and preachers and pastors. Mm -hmm. They were translating the Bible together. They actually translated the Bible in German before Luther. That was in Switzerland. It was in Swiss German. So it's a Mm -hmm. little different dialect. And so Zwingli was actually moving with the reforms and he rejected the uh, Eucharist as being mm-hmm. a um, uh, eating Jesus's body. Uh, he rejected the monasteries. He rejected the uh, celibacy of the priests. Uh, he rejected all kinds of uh, tradition, tradition, the mass. And Zwingli was really moving along with the group. But there's one, at one point where the the group of the reformers around Zwingli said, Zwingli, it's time for to abolish infant baptism. Hmm. That's also just tradition. It's not in the Bible. Uh, it, it cannot save children. There is no merit in, in baptizing kids and children. They don't have true faith. And so at that point, when you have uh, Zwingli said, well, I'm afraid, how will the Zurich Council the, the, the magistrate, how will they respond to that? It's it's going to hit their wallets potentially. Hmm. So, um, and the and the rad and the radical, <laughs> the the other reformers told Zwingli, it doesn't matter. We don't. Ha- the church is not governed by the princes and secular state. The church is governed by God. So they that so again they're taking the the principle of Luther and these guys was that right. they live by the Bible and the Bible alone. alone they took they it continue that. to the logical actual yeah. only logical conclusion, mm-hmm. and so everything started with that. And so they said we need to separate the state. The state needs to work around the different affairs of secular affairs, but the spiritual affairs that needs to be governed by the church mm-hmm. leadership. And so that it all started from there. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Do you believe us? Is it? Could you say as as Adventists or as Bible believers today, our heritage lies more with the radical than the magisterial, or is it is it not as is it not as clear cut as that? Do we get something from both sides? Adventism is pure distilled Anabaptism. Hmm. Okay. There, there's the, 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 we, uh, the only the things that we share with the magisterial Reformation. Mm-hmm. Are the things that Anabaptists would share with uh, the, with the so they just carry those those conclusions we are, on. We are radically Anabaptist. Is seventy percent of Millerite movement was Baptists and Methodists, True. which are all free will movements. Mm-hmm. And Magisterial Reformation, Lutheran, Zwingli, and Calvin are predestination. They believe in predestination. Mm-hmm. 
and we, we can talk about that, why they believe in predestination. But Adventism is, is strongly on the free will side. So that's very Anabaptist. We're strongly on church and state separation. That's mm-hmm. Anabaptist. We're on the Sabbath keeping. There's, uh, there's Sabbath keeping Anabaptists. There are no Sabbath keeping magisterial reformers. Mm. Um, you have eschatological views of the second coming, of the interpretation of prophecies. They're all, Anab- they're all stem from Anabaptism. Uh, you have also, also in early Adventism, you have this, different understanding of the Trinity, which was also a feature of uh, Anabaptism as well. Um, so so you have 70% of the Millerite movement was 40% Methodist, 30% Baptist, and then 20% Christian connection. Christian connection yeah, was James White, James White yeah. Joseph Bates, um, John Andrews, they're all Christian connection. And, the, and Christian connection is a basically American Anabaptism. And they they had this um, they they were they were challenging the Trinity doctrine as well, hmm. and uh, and so they're very free will they're very Anabaptist um, movement. Those are all Anabaptist. Now Anabaptists they didn't. It's not like they came and they continued as a big group. They actually Splint, kind of splintered off a bit. More. They they did splinter. They in in interaction with other movements they changed other movements. Hmm. So interacting with Puritans. In Holland and in England, the Baptists came out of it because it was the Puritan preachers, John Smith, who escaped to Netherlands. He met the Anabaptist and he was converted into an Anabaptist yeah. idea. And then he started his own Baptist church. So Anabaptism really, uh, people say, oh, it's failed because so many, they were killed. Many of them were killed. They didn't really continue as a strong movement. We only have Mennonites today who are the, or Amish mm-hmm. who are the Anabaptist uh, descendants. But they actually had uh, like grandchildren or, or you know, mm. they really engendered in, 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 in interacting with other movements. Like they interacted with uh, John, uh, John Wesley through Moravians. That's true. Yeah. And Moravians have Anabaptist heritage to the Hussites and through the Bohemian mm-hmm. Anabaptists. And so they touched John, John Wesley. They changed his life. Boom, you got Methodism. Mm. And what is Adventism? 70% baptism for you know of Methodism and then 10, 20% Christian connection. That's 90% Anabaptist DNA. Hmm. Fascinating. So we are pretty much not maybe children, but we are the grandsons of the Anabaptists. Of the Anabaptists. Okay. Fascinating. Well, appreciate you sharing. We're just going to take a short break right now. Stay with us. Those of you who are listening, we'll be back in just a few moments. Thank you for being with us and we'll be back shortly. Lineage is a non-profit organization kept running by generous donors like you. Support us today on patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. History shapes identity. Identity shapes mission. And a clear mission determines the trajectory of your future. Knowing where you come from is key to understanding your present purpose and your future mission. Lineage Journey is a series of videos that will take you on a journey through time, discovering the key people and events that have shaped the Christian faith. From the Waldenses to Martin Luther to Zwingli, from England to France, Switzerland to Germany, the light broke over the horizon of Europe, piercing through the dark ages and then spread out over the world. As the United States of America rose to supremacy, Christianity formed the bedrock of this great nation. And so from the Great Awakening to the Great Disappointment and beyond, Lineage follows the journey of God's church throughout time, immersing you in the places, the stories, and the people through whom Christianity has shone the brightest. Join us on a journey through time. Follow us on social media at Lineage Journey or check out our website at lineagejourney.com. Lineage Journey not only produces video content, but instructive and illuminating resources to teach young and old about Christian history. Lineage has produced an educational coloring book for people of all ages. It includes original artwork from Ashley Bloom, highlighting the various heroes of the Reformation. Each scene has a matching story, and there are also QR codes to connect you to the website for more information and to watch the videos. There are also fun facts and memorable quotes to accompany the scenes to color in. Designed for young and old alike, get your copy now at lineagejourney.com.
Welcome back to those of you who are listening to our podcast here on The Anabaptist with Dr. Deutschen Zivadinovic. We've had a fascinating first half. We've looked at The Anabaptist. We've seen where they come from, how they're part of what's called as the Radical Reformation, which is different to the Magisterial Reformation. The Magisterial Reformation is the characters that we know of more famously, such as Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, and so on, whereas the Radical Reformation is slightly less well known. Uh, Anabaptist means rebaptism, and they they believed in the doctrine of rebaptism, meaning that adults should be baptized again. This caused a lot of problems with the state, and it's almost like the Anabaptists wanted to carry things much further and take the logical conclusions of the other reformers that the Bible is our rule of faith and and that we should live by faith, or the just shall live by faith, take them to its logical conclusion and not be hindered by any prince or any state leader who didn't want to take the reform any further. So as Adventists, we see our spiritual heritage really lying with the Anabaptist in terms of their belief on church and state, their belief on baptism, their belief on, um, on, on salvation, their belief on free will. And so in the second half, we're going to look at a few other questions. We're going to unpack them a little bit more. The belief on baptism, so the, the Anabaptists believed in rebaptism, but really because everyone was baptized as a, as a child, so the adults need to baptize as they have a three, free will. Do you think the magisterial reformers opposed it because it conflicted with um, the taxes and the state and finances, or did That's they oppose it on theological grounds? Well, both. Okay. Both, of course. Um, it was uncomfortable. Also, it was a problematic with how it, it actually Zwingli agreed with the Anabaptist. He okay. told him, I agree that infant baptism is not in the Bible. Okay. But um, it's, we're going to move as fast, he said, in our reforming the city, as fast as the city, Zurich City Council wants to. Hmm. And so if the Zurich City Council, and there's like 50 people in the council, if they vote against it, we're not going you to implement it. just have to go slow. And the radical form is like, we don't, that's not how, we don't care. Yeah, we've got to go with the fifth, Bible. Yeah, we go with the Bible. doesn't matter. Live what by conviction. Live by conviction. And mm. um, so that was, that was one of the major problems, yeah, for the Anabaptists, that just state being involved in your faith. They can't dictate. It well, dictates. It dictates. Yeah. It slows down and just it, it and, and, and the your principle faith. of the Protestant Reformation that we we like to hold on to, and I think they take to his conclusion is that, and even Martin Luther, that famous quote by him, like my conscience is captive to the word of God. Right. Here I am. I can do no other. And maybe he himself and some areas didn't take that to his full conclusion, but that's really what they're doing. They're saying, listen, our conscience, our conscience, our mind is captive to what we're reading in the Bible. Right. And so magisterial reformers really replace papacy with the state. Mm. And this is what Martin Luther wrote. So you go from a Catholic state to a Protestant state. Right. And so Martin Luther wrote in 1521 to the Christian nobility of the German nation, his book, he says, we don't need popes, we don't need bishops. They don't dictate, but we need godly magistrates. Mm. So it's your opportunity now. You don't have to bring pay taxes to, the, to Rome. You keep those taxes and then you build schools to read the Bible for people mm. and so people can be literate. And that's a good to a degree. It's a, it's a step to a better direction, but it's not, it's not, Anabaptists were saying, yes, yeah, you can build schools, you can use your money for it, but you cannot hamper conscience. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another problem is that these Anabaptists, so it's not just the state, uh, so just how, how far the state goes. There were some uh, theological grounds, like for example, Zwingli would say, well, what would you say if, you know, in the Old Testament, people would get circumcised when they're babies? And so Apostle Paul identifies circumcision with baptism in Colossians chapter 2. So why don't we baptize babies then? Mm -hmm. so, so we just, from circumcision was a type of baptism. So if circumcision would baptize a baby, then we also have to baptize babies. Mm. Well, the Anabaptists had her in response. They're saying, yeah, we do baptize babies. We baptize spiritual babies. Mm. When you're born again, you're when a baby. You're born again. When you're yeah, really yeah, born yeah. again, you're a baby. And so it is. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Maybe it's just a baby in the face. Just the Old Testament was physical. And the New Testament circumcision. This spirit. is the circumcision mm -hmm. of the heart. Baptism is circumcision of the heart. How can you circumcise the heart of the baby? It's a physical baby. The baby doesn't cannot have that decision made for. Him. Yeah. Hmm. So fascinating. So we've really got the 
In terms of doctrines from them, we've got baptism, as we mentioned in our review. We've also got free will, which we yeah. see strongly linked in, 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 in our heritage. We've got the belief on church should be separated from the state, mm-hmm. should not be held in by captive in terms of its beliefs to it. Yeah. I want to move on and ask another question. As, as Adventists, we... Seventh-day Adventists, we hold the writings of Ellen White to be inspired. Right. And we believe that she, you know, she's a prophet and she had the gift of prophecy and and wrote many excellent books, one of which is The Great Controversy, which I'm sure you've read and many of our readers would have read as well. But the Radical Reformation and the Anabaptists are not mentioned so prominently in that book, and I don't believe elsewhere in the writings. But That's correct. So, And there's a reason for that. Okay. Well, she did. She does mention in in few in in two pages Menno Simmons, who was the leader of the Anabaptists in Holland. Mm-hmm. He is um, the most pacifist one, the one that is most famous Anabaptist in Holland, who had a lot of success, and many people in Netherlands became Anabaptists because of Menno Simmons. And so uh, he, the reason why Ellen White doesn't place more emphasis is because Great Controversy is evangelistic book. And 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 um, and it's an evangelistic book, and it's trying to portray Adventist movement as the continuation of the Reformation. Hmm. Where who are you talking to? You're talking to the Great Country was a was a colporting seller. That's true. And so, who are you talking to with that book? Lutheran. You're talking to the Lutherans. You're talking to the American Protestants. You're talking to everybody who knows the heroes of the Reformation: are hmm. Luther, Calvin, Swingley. They don't know about the Anabaptists. And also, in the 19th century, it wasn't really clear. The distinction between the violent socialist Anabaptist Munzer movement oh, okay. and course, the course. and the pacifist Menno Simmons and the Swiss Anabaptists and the Bohemian Anabaptists were super pacifist, and so that distinction wasn't clear in the 19th century. So if Ellen White would spend more time on trying to point out how we are Anabaptist, this is our real DNA, that would just bring Adventist movement into um, kind of like. You're one of Thomas Munzer's people. Yeah, you. It, it wouldn't really. Sh- uh, yeah, it would. It would bring the Adventist movement into, into. It would associate it with something that is not known mm-hmm. to the Protestant public, and it's also misunderstood to the Protestant public. So when Ellen White talks about the Reformation, she men- she mentions people that the the people in America know about, hmm. and wants to show how we're we are coming out. We're just continuing the reforms of Luther, mm-hmm. of Zwingli, of Calvin. Of John Smith, of of Menno Simmons, of Wesley. She mentioned Wesley, mm-hmm. and then going on into Miller Millerite movement. So that was her goal, and uh, and it hmm. would just confuse the readership if you would h- harp on Anabaptists, even though that's technically correct. Mm-hmm. We're much more actually our lineage goes to Anabaptists rather than the Magisterials, mm-hmm. but it would just confuse people at that time. Today mm-hmm. it's not so confusing because even today in evangelical Christendom. Anabaptist movement is is seen as uh, not so much anymore as a as a negative, and so people have rediscovered Anabaptist Anabaptist roots in American Protestantism as mm. well. Yeah. yeah, that that makes sense. Like you said, the Great Controversy was written as a Cold Water book right. for yeah. people to sell door to door, and right. they're selling it to a largely Christian Protestant audience who would have known Luther, yeah. Calvin, right. Zwingli, and. That's and right. the, Wesley very well, so that that does make sense, and she she obviously makes the connections. And she with doesn't each. mention Wesley much. Not really. She, no. she just mentions his name mm-hmm. because even Wesley was controversial. Wesley republished Armenian uh, he, Arminius, who was who was influenced by Anabaptist. Wesley uh, republished a, a he was focusing on the free will idea, mm-hmm. uh, breaking away from Puritan teaching of his mother, of the predestination. And so Wesley was also considered a little bit of a Methodist movement, although it was growing. It was a very popular movement in America. It was probably the most growing, the biggest growing church. Uh, also, um, you have to see who are you talking to. You're not only talking to the Methodists. You're talking to m- most of the other Protestants mm-hmm. as well. So she doesn't even mention Wesley a lot. No, you're she's, right. She's very tactful in, in some of these things, yeah. Hmm. So you've mentioned Wingley and and. It's fascinating the connection he had with the with the Zurich Council, and you know as Adventists we do hold some of these reformers such as Wingley in high regard because if if my study of history is correct, our, our view of communion is largely influenced from 
yes, from Zwingli, Zwingli who yeah. clashed with Luther on that particular doctrine. That's right. And and Calvin as well. Maybe that clash wasn't as 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 strong as Luther. Yeah. But do you think we maybe overemphasize the role of some of the magisterial reformers? Or have romanticized them too much? <laughs> and maybe that's a controversial question. I don't know. No, but what it's think? a great question. Um, I think it's a good PR, <laughs> especially in the 19th century, Ellen White writing about these reformers that everybody venerates and loves and saying, we are in the same line of thought, but we're, we're just st- taking another step in Reformation, mm-hmm. just taking another step. Um, so it was, it was a conscious decision from the Holy Spirit influencing you know, spirit of prophecy, obviously. And it is also useful when you talk with the majority of the Christian world mm-hmm. and to sh- to point out our common lineage with uh, reformers mm-hmm. such as Luther and Zwingli and Calvin. And so that is, we shouldn't just, you know, take it aside and then we just we just hone on Anabaptists. True. So that's that's useful. At the same time, every every knife has has a, the other side of the blade. So at the same time, when you when you do that, oftentimes you kind of narrow down your focus, and then you start thinking that uh, that you agree with Zwingli more than you actually agree with. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know? And so Zwing, we need to be able to to read them in context. Mm-hmm. Zwingli, Calvin, Luther, these major reformers, they took such a bold step mm-hmm. going against the you know the entire empire mm-hmm. at that time. So it was a very bold step. It was a, uh, it was a great uh, movement towards. They reformed many things, and uh, that's how they should be remembered. But at the same time, um, it, I don't really blame Luther and Zwingli and Calvin for not reforming more. But uh, we need to focus more on people who came after Luther, mm, people who came after Calvin, the progression, people who got kind of stuck with Luther and saying, okay, whatever Luther discovered in the Bible and reformed, that's it. No more reformation, you know? Mm. But Luther pretty much, he he reformed the church back to Augustine. When you read Luther, he was an Augustinian monk. Mm -hmm. So he really uh, reformed the church back to the fourth century, not to the first century. Mm. He came to Augustine and he stopped there, right? Mm. (laughs) How do, I mean, maybe this is... Aside, but it's still related. How do we reconcile when we look back in our history? And it's interesting to look at, you know, for example, Luther and Zwingli's disagreement, or we've brought up here the disagreement between Zwingli and the and the Anabaptists, and yet we see ourselves having a heritage in both of them. Right. How do we reconcile some of these famous figures or famous groups having serious disagreements with? They at had the serious time? flaws. These mm. people had serious flaws, and we all have them. <laughs> Uh, when you know we're standing on their shoulders, criticizing their shoulders, True. Uh, because we're taller than them now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they had flaws, and uh, we need to look at. And the same history. When you when you study history, you really have to judge people. For first of all, you shouldn't judge, but you really have to measure. Or if you want to measure in your mind what's better, what's what's not as good in history, you really have to compare people in the 16th century among each other. Among, among each other. So if you're looking at 16th century reformers, you have to compare them with one another. You don't compare them with like with with, us today, with us today what okay. we know today. And same thing when it comes to slavery, same thing when it goes to different issues in societies. And we s- judge people with our moral standards and with our advancements mm-hmm. and with our today. enlightenment of today. We judge people back in the day, how they had conquest and had things like that. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they had major flaws. But Everyone had major flaws. Everyone had those problems. Mm-hmm. What were the unique that they actually contributed positive that other people didn't? Mm. That is what it's. That's what what that's what that's what at. we should look at. What that's what separates them from heritage. the pack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier, but maybe just re- reiterate again in terms of what what denominations today, or what religious groups come out from came out of Anabaptism. Right. So directly, the Anabaptists, um, first of all, Anabaptists were heavily persecuted. And uh, they didn't have any protection from Mm -hmm. any state or civil magistrate. So they would escape to different places, but uh, oftentimes they were persecuted both by Catholics and the Protestants. And the um, 
Um, so they didn't really have a strong, um, they didn't establish national churches like Lutheran mm-hmm. churches or Anglican churches. Uh, they, they directly, what comes out of the, Anaba- of the Anabaptists, uh, the Mennonites today, okay. which is maybe, what, two million people mm. all mm-hmm. over the world, I think, two or three. The Mennonite church uh, all over the world is the direct descendant of the Anabaptists. Okay. So if you go on, on internet and you find Mennonite encyclopedia or Anabaptist encyclopedia, it's, mm-hmm. it's usually Mennonist, Mennonist uh, academics that will, uh, and they have a lot of good books on the Anabaptist movement. Um, so the Amish are kind of the Mennonites who got stuck in the 19th century. The, the Amish really... They are kind of connected. They're the same belief, except that the Amish don't believe in electricity, basically. Uh, so why? Why would the Amish do... Because, again, separ- it's a little more radical separation of church and state. Mm-hmm. Because they believe that if they introduce, let's say, electricity or gas mm-hmm. or modern advancements they become dependent to the state uh, and then the, and so their strings attached they want to be off the grid so cool. they're like they're going they want to be off the grid because we have history of being persecuted by the state mm. so we don't want to be dependent on the state so we don't want to be bullied by the state so we're just we're just going to be independent so that's the amish uh, they got stuck in the 19th century because of that so, I, so no I cars, see. no electricity, yeah. nothing. But Mennonites are basically the same theological teachings uh, of the Anabaptists. And the but Amish, the Mennonites do... But the Mennonites do... are modern. Okay. So they're like, no, there's no strings attached. And if they are, we'll just deattach them. And you know, if they ever persecute us and they don't give us electricity, we're not going to change our fate because of that. But I'm going to dress modern. I'm going to use the advancements of the modern world and phone, mm-hmm. the electricity, everything. And that's not going to change my face. So that's the Mennonites. Mennonites were mm. kind of like, this is not going to, they were not ec- ultra afraid of the state, mm-hmm. but they still believe, of course, okay. separation church and state. And uh, pacifism is a big deal with Mennonites, helping one another. There are different groups of Anabaptists, even in the 16th century, there's some Anabaptists who believed in, you know, living communally like Hutterites. The Hutterites, even today exist in the United States, the Hutterites, and they have a community where they share everything in common. You see, that can be tricky. I'm like, oh, you're socialist, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're Munzer, like Thomas Munzer, social. No, they're not. They're mm-hmm. not. They're just pacifists. But they share within their community everything in common with whatever they're, okay. they earn. So that those would be direct. Uh, those would be direct uh, descendants of the Anabaptists. The indirect would be Anabaptists also interacted with other uh, churches. So when the Puritans interacted and the uh, Calvinists, when they interacted with them in Holland and in England, uh, they adopted their view of baptism. Mm. They're saying, you're right. Mm-hmm. This is, we need to, we are saved by faith. Mm-hmm. Just like Luther and Calvin say, and we're Puritans. We, John Calvin is our hero. And so why are we baptizing infants? I don't know. Uh, this, they have no faith. Boom. Those Puritans became what we know, Baptist. Mm. And so, so, so it's kind of like bouncing off the Anabaptist. So the uh, ideas spread for the ideas, yeah. the, the the Anabaptist ideas. Actually, American, the American country, the entire is built on separation. It's built, a, it's of built on separation, church and state, free will, Methodist and Baptist churches were very mm-hmm. strong and prominent here in the United mm. States. Yeah. So it's fascinating. I pre- really, I mean, that connection between the Mennonites and the Amish and and their. I've always wondered, to be honest myself, why why yeah. don't they drive cars or have electricity? And that that makes total sense. So appreciate the, you sharing that. The Anabaptists had a strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit, okay, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a Christian. That was their main thing, actually. We which we didn't mention this podcast. I think we need to mention, and so that kind of later became Wesley Assurance, mm-hmm. Blessed Assurance, mm-hmm. Jesus is my Assurance of Salvation. Mm. You actually feel Holy Spirit changing you. You see the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the changing the character and the mind, the sanctification. So that was a very strong influence that the Anabaptists gave to the evangelical movement as well. So all the evangelical movement today is kind of retrieving back into Lutheran mm-hmm. position of just forensic justification, mm-hmm. no transformation during justification. And once saved, always saved kind of idea. Uh, well, Anabaptists completely repudiated that idea of once saved, always saved. They said, no, you once saved, you better stay saved. You can lose your salvation by willful, continual sin. And so they had a very different way of salvation. And uh, they believed in present assurance, but uh, not in in, in uh, a presumptuous assurance. Hmm. 
If there is no work of the Holy Spirit in you, if there is no love, patience, kindness, joy in, in persecution, there is no Holy Spirit in you. If you don't have Holy Spirit, you are not of Him. And so they quoted Romans 8 saying, if we don't have the Spirit of Christ, we're not of Him. And so the Spirit of God manifested in a, in a Christian was the evidence of justification. Hmm. And that was the big stress of the Anabaptists. And hmm. I think that should be a big that's stress right. yeah, in Adventism yeah. as well. Yeah. So as, as we come to a close, I wondered if you could share any particular stories of the Anabaptists. We've talk, kind of talked about the movement as a whole, yeah. but they were persecuted. That's, that's, right. that's one thing you mentioned. Are there any particular stories of Anabaptists that you yourself find well, encouraging or every, inspiring? Everybody loves the story of Dirk Willems. He's a hero in Holland. There's a lot of stories of Anabaptists, but this, kind of, this story kind of encapsulates what I just talked about. If you are really born again, you love your enemies. Mm. Mm -hmm. You love your enemies. You don't hate them. You don't use the sword of civil authority to force them into into your belief. Mm -hmm. And so this love for enemies was evidence of the Holy Spirit conversion. That was such a prominent motif. Um, so knowing that you that 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 is a very important concept when it, when you talk about Anabaptism. And so there's a, you know, everybody knows the story of Dirk Willems, but maybe some maybe not. Know, so maybe not. Share right? it, share it. Anyway, so Dirk Willems, he was a Anabaptist pastor who was captured in Holland, and uh, you know he was preaching Anabaptist doctrines, and he was captured. Of course, he was he was about to be killed and drowned, or sometimes they would be hanged. But most of the times, Anabaptism, if you're Anabaptist, you would get drowned. Mm -hmm. They would call it. Here you go, get your third baptism. Hmm. You want to get baptized again? Boom. And mm. drowned him. Really sad. So he was waiting for his uh, execution in a prison, and for some reason it kind of protracted. Mm -hmm. And he was in prison for several months, and he became. And they didn't really feed him very well, so he was. He became very thin, and somehow he was able to actually wiggle himself through the uh, cell, through the door, through the window of the prison. So he wiggled his thin body. Hmm. He was able to escape the prison, and as he was climbing down from the prison second floor, he f fell down on the ice uh, a lake, but it didn't break because he was so thin. And he, as he was running across the frozen lake to escape his punishment, a prison guards prison guards noticed him, and they started running after him. Now prison guards were much thicker, mm -hmm. and so as they started running after Dirk Willems. Uh, one prison guard particularly uh, crashed crashed through the ice and fell through the ice down into into cold ice water and started drowning. People didn't know how to swim back in the day, especially and, and it was cold water. Anyways, so Dirk Willems turns around and he sees his enemy dying because of him, hmm. because he tried to escape. So now somebody else is killed, and they believe in pacifism, right? No violence, separation of state, mm -hmm. no civil power. They don't believe in using violence against anyone, and especially killing, not even enemies. And so they're looking at and they say, somebody's dying because of me. Somebody's losing their chance of maybe getting saved one day because mm -hmm. of me. So he went back, and he saved the guard. He took him out of the frozen lake. He saved the life of the guard. The guard still captured him. He, he still captured him. Took him mm, back to because the romantic end would be he captured the guard and the guard, and the guard says would, I'll oh, give you, you two go. minutes and off you two go. Minutes. No, the guard still captured him, took him back to prison, and he was hanged the next week. Wow! And so Dirk Willems, there's a statue of Dirk Willems in in in, in, in Netherlands today. He's like a symbol of, um, he's kind of symbol of Holland almost. He's mm -hmm. a symbol of we need to live in peace and unity between different religious groups. Mm. And so the thing is, why did Dirk Williams do that? Because he really loved his his human more than his own life. Mm. That's wanted, a powerful story. And that's a powerful story because it shows you what the Anabaptists were so ahead of their time. I mean, Luther, he when he would disagree a little bit with somebody, he would just get angry. And he didn't like his enemies. Yeah, there is report. They, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they had issues. Luther had issues with anger and all that stuff. And he was frustrated. And so Anabaptists really, um, we need to be focusing on their message a lot more. Hmm. And um, and not, you know, of course, not neglecting Luther and Calvin and Zwingli. Those are heroes as well. But uh, the Anabaptist message was so ahead of time and, and is definitely focusing on the work of God, not just for us, but in us. Mm -hmm. Christian is a change, a new creation, mm -hmm. a new creature. A Christian is it demonstrates that not just by 
theological ascent to a new set of beliefs, mm -hmm. but a, a changed personality, changed heart. And this is unfortunately what Luther said. He says, with us, there is no betterment of life. Mm. We oppose papists based on doctrine, not based on lifestyle. Mm. You know? So he says, with us, there is no betterment of life, he said. This mm. is what Luther says. Why did Luther, who preached justification by faith, who created such a great reformation from the papal church, and then after his whole life working as a pastor in Wittenberg, he says, I don't see any betterment of life among our Christians than from the Catholics. Mm. Because Sad. he didn't stress enough on, on the um, internal, internal evidence of justification. Mm. Yeah. So we did mention the break. Who... Was Thomas, another story, was Thomas Mainz the first martyr or was he just a famous one? Felix Mainz. Oh, Felix, sorry. Felix Mainz was the first Anabaptist martyr. He was the first one, okay. He was the first who was drowned and then Conrad Grebel was later also uh, captured. Most, most, this is why we don't, see Luther never died martyr death, neither did Calvin. They all lived, they were protected by the state. Hmm. And they all lived until their death, and they lived for a long life, for 40, 30, 40 years, writing a lot of books and became famous, you know. Um, but if you're an Anabaptist, um, you will be persecuted immediately. And so you, if you're a pastor, an Anabaptist pastor, you're causing all the problem. So the, the average lifespan of an Anabaptist pastor was like five to 10 years. After you become a pastor, in the next five years, you'll be martyred hmm. for sure. You have like Conrad Grebel, like five years. Balthazar Hubmeier lived for like 12 years, which was like unheard of hmm. after he became a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have a lot of uh, those Anabaptist leaders. You don't, you don't, they don't live long. They don't, don't live long, many you books. know. And they, they, they know that they will be, they will almost certainly be, get, get killed. Okay. So, well, I appreciate yeah. you sharing. I appreciate you going through the stories and, and, and showing the connection between magisterial reformation and the radical reformation, looking at some of the heritage and Amen. what denominations have come from them, but also more so what are the heritage of their ideas and not just that, not ideas really, that the theology that they discovered mm -hmm. and, and how that impacts how we think, how we study, and mm -hmm. also how we live today. I, I really think what maybe one of the things we could say about the Anabaptists is their their religion was a practical religion. Yeah. And they, they really believed in following the Bible to its full conclusion and to live by conviction. Right. And I think as Adventists today, or as believers today, whatever um, faith um, persuasion we come from, we really need to take the Bible seriously. Right. And we need to take the Bible to its full conclusion. Right. And to, to live by faith and not have our faith dictated by anyone else. Amen. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Dojin Zhivadinovic. Appreciate <laughs> you taking the time to share with us and really appreciate you going into this subject. In, Good in, job pronouncing my last name. <laughs> do my best and in a little bit more detail. And to those of you who are listening, thank you for listening to this podcast on the Anabaptist and stay tuned as more podcasts come out. We really thank you for listening. We thank you for your support and we pray that God may bless you in your spiritual journey as you continue to follow God as he leads and guides you. Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Lineage Journey is supported by your generous donations. Did you know that you can donate on a monthly basis? Any amount from $2 to 100 or whatever you decide through patreon.com forward slash lineage journey. Your donations go towards the cost of producing our varied content and we thank you for your support.